Tito Francona. What's up, Tito? Case, how are you, man? I, I got I got to remember that we're we're actually like doing something legit here, so I got to be careful what I say to you because stuff starts flying out, and I don't want to get in trouble with HR on my second day on the job. <laughs> you on this one brother man i am so fired up for this guy it's gonna be incredible this is like having one of your teachers from like when you grew up on uh, on your show for you right now this is like <laughs> a big moment in sean casey's life right now dude i want to give a quick introduction to this guy because he he doesn't need one but if you're on coming on the mayor's office you need one this guy's one of the greatest managers of all time and don't forget chinch for for for, for Terry Francona's sake, this guy played 10 years in the big leagues. I don't think guys know that. This guy was a second-round pick out of high school and a first-round pick out of Arizona, which is unbelievable. You never know how humble this guy is. But um, two-time World Series champ, almost won the World Series with the Guardians, and coming back as a Cincinnati Reds manager, I think for the specific reason to get another world title. Let's bring him in. One of my dear friends, brother, Tito Francona. What's up, Tito? Case, how are you, man? I, I got I got to remember that we're we're actually like doing something legit here, so I got to be careful what I say to you because stuff starts flying out, and I don't want to get in trouble with HR on my second day on the job. <laughs> we'll keep it tight, brother. We'll keep it tight, man. I have to ask you. I know people have asked you, but you haven't told me. Like, why? Why did you come back? Uh, what are you excited about? And what was it about the Reds that you're like? This is the team I want to come back to. Okay, so truth be told, I'm not going to give you the, the manager speak, right. you know, answer. Yes. I was in Salt Lake City visiting one of my dear friends. Uh, we went and played golf a couple days. We went to the uh, Utah, Arizona football game that night. And I'm like enjoying retired life. And I mean, I was retired. Like I was, you know, doing it all. And the Reds reached out and... You remember in Major League where, you know, they call the guy and they want him to do the job and he's got he's got tires on a rack or he goes, I'll get back to you. Yeah. And I think I think at best my response was probably lukewarm. And then I called him back and I said, you know what? I said, you know, if you guys want to talk, because I started looking at the team a little bit, and I said, I'll I'll, you know, I'll talk to you. Well, they flew out to to Tucson, which blew me away. Yeah. It blew me away. I couldn't believe they they I, that, and about 40 minutes into it, I started hearing myself saying we, and I'm like, wow. Hey, I'm like, Hey man, slow down. Like, you know, you're not, right. but so like the same feeling I had when I went to Cleveland, I went to Cleveland. I thought for the right reasons, I thought I left Cleveland for the right reasons. This just feels right. I started visiting with Nick and Brad and it just felt like I'm in an age where like, you know, doesn't mean you're not going to get challenged because there are going to be a million challenges. But doing right. it with people that you kind of feel like you're going to get close to and trust and have your back, that that that's the feeling I got, and that's the feeling I'm getting. And, and so it, it makes me feel like I, the energy starts to come back. Yeah, that's they're great people, man. Nick Crawl is great, and, and obviously Bob Castellini and that whole organization. And, and, Tito, you have history with them. You played for the Reds. What was it, 1987? Yeah, and no, they're not holding that against me, which is <laughs> which is good. Hey, that home run is all over the internet right now. <laughs> yeah, but you got to remember though. So that was that was opening day. The only problem with that year was the next 161 did not go well. <laughs> <laughs> That's so great. Dude, when you look at that this organization and you go back, you go back to that team, because I look I looked up uh, some of the guys in that team, Barry Larkin was just kind of coming in. Paul O'Neill was just kind of coming in. Like Eric Davis, Dave Parker was there, Concepcion. Like, did you take anything from these guys, brother? Like, a a on with your career, like that you learned from that year with the Reds. Case the number and one Pete, thing I Pete learned was your manager. The the number one thing I learned was if I would not have been on that team, I think we'd have made the playoffs. <laughs> <laughs> because you're right, man. It was loaded. I mean, they had veterans 
they had young guys. They had guys like Cal Daniels, Tracy Jones, on top of like you know Eric Davis and Kurt Stillwell and Lark. I mean, it was they were loaded and yeah. and playing for Pete because you know I had played with Pete nice. in Montreal. And anybody oh, that wow, anybody that was teammates with Pete, I'm telling you, man, you revered him. Like, I mean, I know he had his missteps along the way. I get it. But yeah. when you play with Pete, you can't find a better teammate. And so I, it was like, like when I was making outs in Cincinnati, it's like I felt guilty. I'm like, God, I'm letting this guy down. You know, he he, he brought me in and he trusted me, and I just couldn't get a hit case. And like. <laughs> I mean, it just was awful, but, but I mean, I tell you what, I, and you know this better than probably anybody. I don't think young people realize how good a baseball town Cincinnati can be. Oh. Like they love their reds. So, and it's, they, it's Midwest. So it's like, there's yes. just so many good things about it. Yeah. Especially when you're winning. And, and I think too, like, I know. Terry Francona is not coming out from watching football games and being with his grandkids and doing all the things if he doesn't think he can win now. And that was one of the biggest things, Tito. When I saw you're going to the Reds, I was like, there's no doubt he looks at this roster and says, I can win with these guys. Who are the guys on the roster that you look at and you go, wow, we're, we're ready. We're ready to win. Well, I, 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 we may not be ready yet, but we're going to get there. Um, yeah. To your point, it actually reminds me a little bit of back in the 87 team because they had so many good young players, but also of the Guardians a couple years ago when they had all these young guys. And and it, it's actually kind of fun because you, you think maybe you can, or the hope is that you can make a difference. And you see guys like like Ellie and, I mean, and uh, uh, Steer and, I mean, uh, McLean. I mean, guys, uh, Friedel. And go, I don't want to yeah. start leaving guys off. Stevenson yeah, behind the dish. Incarnacio Strand. You got and yeah. you got some some young pitchers that got a chance to be <laughs> pretty damn good. So that part was really appealing to me. Tito, you know, dude, one of the greatest things with playing with you, I'll never forget being. It was my last year in the big leagues, and I always wanted to play for you. I always wanted to play for the Red Sox. I remember being in the spring training. In the meeting, and when when you brought us all in after we had the team, I think it was the first meeting, and you're like, and it you was I, just the confidence that you brought to that clubhouse. I was I wanted to run through a brick wall after you said it, but you're like, hey guys, we're here for one goal and one goal only to win the World Series, and that's what we're gonna do. And I was like, let's go. I've never heard of you know. I don't you don't usually hear managers say that. He's like, that's what we do here in Boston. So like, you you coming into this situation with the Reds, Tito? Is that still your thought process? And what are you expecting out of the players? When you get there that, that first day. Okay, so first of all, to, to hear you say that kind of fires me up because I stress <laughs> over that meeting so much. And, and you know, the last thing you want is, like, players rolling their eyes or, like, you know, like, hey, man, whatever, man, you know. And so so it kind of makes me feel good that you say that. Um, you know, how, how we feel about the game case never changes. I do think the message can change dependent on what kind of team you're talking to and maybe – you know, if it's, is it a veteran team, is it a young team? I just try to always be honest and because I don't want guys to assume what's expected out of them because I don't think that's fair. But right. so you try to explain to guys, hey, this is how we're going to try to play the game. And and it's there's only one way to play it. And we're here to win. And, and that's everything we do is going to be geared towards seeing if we can be better than teams we're playing against. Yeah. Wow, and that's hard that. to do. I, I mean, everybody that's, would like to win, but that's that's yeah. going to be our goal, and it you got to start yeah. from day one. Case, what's that? What's that lid you got on right there, dude? You kidding me? It's my favorite hat. You know me, Chase. I'm 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 a hat snob, dude. I really am. This is my new melon hat. I've had it for a few months now, dude. It's incredible. It's super comfortable. The one thing I love about it too, you know, sometimes you wear hats all the time that get those sweat stains. This hat doesn't oh, yeah. get a sweat stain. It's got unbelievable comfort fitting. It's it, it fits perfectly with the snapback on the back. It's, it's, uh, five times more durable, I think, than any other hat I've ever had. So, man, this hat's incredible. The melon hat, man. You gotta get you gotta get a couple of these, brother. Yeah, dude, I've heard about him. It's like the most premium, durable headwear in like the whole world. And you know, people use them for tailgating, working out on a golf course. You're going golfing later today. Yep. Heading out for date night with Sarah. <laughs> throw the melon cap on right yeah, am i right i wear it for everything dude the only thing i can't wear it to is premium restaurants where they're like okay you got
got to take your hat off. So other than that, I'm wearing my melon hat pretty much everywhere. Dude, it's my new favorite hat. I've been wearing my melon hat for the uh, past few months straight, dude. No sweat stains, what I said. No smell. Looks the same as the day that I took it out of the box. I get a ton of compliments on it every time I wear it. It's even better. They have different options for different weather. If it's warm out or it might be jumping in the pool, lake, or ocean, you need their hydro collection, bro. The hydro collection is next level change. You'd love that. But when it gets cold and you need to stay warm, don't worry, brother. Melon has you covered there as well. They have a full thermal collection with different levels of warmth to keep you on whatever you need for when the winter's coming up, brother. Big time. Nice. So if you're looking for hats as tough as you, my man, check out Melon. You won't wear anything else after you get one on for yourself. And I know I've been loving my Melon. Yeah, listen to Sean Casey, folks. If you're looking for the world's most durable hat, look no further. Go to melon.com. That's M E L I N.com and put it to the test yourself. Yes. Tito, what's make, what makes you different as a manager, man? Then what? Than, than anybody. I mean, so why do why do you go? No, seriously. Why do you go? Why do you go to the Guardians? When you went to the Guardians, I don't think people thought you were going to win the way you did. And all of a sudden, like, oh, Terry Francona is there, and they're ninety two wins, ninety three wins, eighty eight wins. Like, what do you think that you bring to the table? You know what, Case? I, I, I I'm not sure. It kind of scares me because <laughs> um, I do. You know what? I you were not saying. good players make the manager a lot smarter. But I just, and you know, I, I just never try to throw stuff against the wall. I don't try to BS anybody. I, I, I know personally how hard this game was. Um, but I just try, and I, I'd like to think I can connect with just about anybody. Because, I, I mean, I, yeah. I, I love the players. There's no getting around it. And I don't need, feel the need to lie about that. I, you get close to the players. Yeah, does it make some of the decisions yeah. harder? Yeah, it does. But you get around these guys, man, it's hard not to kind of get fond of them. And, you know, yeah, you get mad at them sometimes. You got to get after them. But I think when you build a relationship where they start to trust you, you can tell some guys things they don't necessarily want to hear and you'll be okay. Yeah. Dude, I, I just want to, I want to say something really quick, you know, before my next question is that like, I'm excited for the Cincinnati Reds because these players that are in that locker room, I'm speaking on behalf of a guys that a guy that's played for you and guys that have been in that locker room. Dude, you're the best. You're the best communicator. You have such a way to make every guy in that clubhouse feel that they're so important to the team, and but you also know that you're the boss. That's a tough. That's a tough line well, to, to uh, a line to walk because I've been with managers that you you could walk on, and I've been with managers that weren't good communicators. To be a good communicator, but also have the presence of hey, listen. I'm a, I'm a good guy and everything, but don't mistake my kindness for weakness because I'm the leader. You know what, Case? And I actually, the way you said that was really good, which really surprises me. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I'll take it a step further. Um, that's part of why I stepped down in Cleveland. I was not mad at anybody. I loved my bosses there. You know those guys there. They're salt to the yes. earth, man. Like they're. Yep. But I was not doing some of the things – that you just talked about the way I felt was appropriate. And a lot of it was due to my health, but along with that, you start to get frustrated. I wasn't feeling good. You start getting short of patience. All the attributes that maybe you think you need as a manager were becoming harder for me. And and I yeah. felt like, and I told Chris Antonetti, I said, Chris, I don't want to shortchange anybody. And those guys are so great. They're like, hey, we can work around it. I just didn't feel good about that. I was leaning on people, on, and thank goodness, I mean, some of the coaches like Carl Willis and DeMarlo Hale and Sandy Alomar, I mean, I was so lucky to have those guys, but I also didn't think it was fair. And that's why, like, having a year away, you know, like I said, I lost some weight. I got some energy. I need to be able to get out there and, and do the things that, you know, not like I got to steal a base, but – I got to be able to, you know, get out there and do some stuff and connect with guys. Yeah. Oh, man. I, I'm just excited that you're back, Tito. I'm excited you're feeling good. I think that year off was was, was, was probably great for you. Have you been watching the postseason at all? And, and, and you know, what, what are you seeing? Are, you know, and, and your Guardians are obviously, or, or, you know, the team you've been with for 11 years, they're in it too. So what are you seeing in the postseason so far? Okay, I'll go back even further than that. I've probably watched more baseball this year than I have in a long time. <laughs> Just because, That's I, you know, I got in a mode where I was watching the team that was we were going to play next. And, and it right. just 
became kind of a grind. Now, this year, I'd pick out a game that was tied in the eighth inning and turn it on and watch the end of it, or, you know, I'd watch the Guardians a lot because, you know, you can't be someplace for 11 years and not care about a lot of people. And I think Stephen Vogt, like, I think they hit a home run. Like, I told Chris and Cherney in, in the middle of August, I said, guys, I said, you guys have been so good to me. Go find your next manager and don't tiptoe around me. I said, you guys have treated me like gold. And 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 they did a really good job. And I'm I'm a big fan of his already. And I mean this this yeah. this guy, he, he gets it. Like I think, you know, he takes the game very seriously, but I don't think he takes himself too serious. And I think that's kind of a good I think that's a good way of going about things. Yeah, yeah. Oh, there's no doubt. When you talk, when you obviously you were the manager for this Guardians team for the last so many years, and you had a lot of these guys. Can you talk about Jose Ramirez? Because you know sometimes people, some people say he's uh, uh, underrated, which obviously that's not true. Because when you're in the MVP talks like seven years in a row, you're not underrated. He's one of the best players in the game. Almost went forty, forty, forty. What makes him so good, Tito? Well, I'll tell you what. And part of what you're, I think, alluding to is you know he's in a small market. You know, he, and he doesn't speak a ton of English. That's, that's okay. That's not a, you know, but it's so he's not out doing commercials and things like that. But Case, right. this kid is what you're looking for. I mean, if you're looking for, for a, a baseball player, this kid, you want him on your side. I mean, I, I tell people all the time, the best way I knew to aggravate him and to kind of piss him off was tell him when he's on third base that he couldn't go on contact because he wants to be in the middle of the action all the time. Like, he just, like, when your best player plays the game like their pants are on fire, it makes the message a lot easier to the younger guys, believe me. And he's he's the best right. example. He's, I mean, you know, you got guys like Pedroia, guys like that. I mean, I, he's he's unbelievable. I mean, I can't, I could go on and on about the kid, and he deserves it. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking, speaking of best players, uh, I think it's, first of all, a sign of a great franchise when you can lose your best player and still be successful and replace with, like, Ramirez. But how about Frankie Lindor right now with the New York Mets and how amazing he is as a ball player? And you know what? And we probably caught a break there because, you know, we traded we traded him and Carlos Carrasco for Ahmed Rosario. And Andres Jimenez was kind of a, maybe the lesser name in the trade. And this kid, you know, is like the best defender in the league. And he's a great kid and he's young and he he will hit better than he's hit. So that but Lindor, you know what? I, I think it probably took him a little while to get used to New York, which I think is fair and but there's nothing on the field he can't do. And and I gotta admit, I know I'm probably showing my age, but when he hit that home run and he ran around the bases like he had done it before, I was yes. so proud of him. I actually sent a note to uh, Mike Sarbaugh, the third base coach, and I said, tell Frankie how proud of him I am because I just love that. Yeah. Well, you know what's funny, Tito? I, I thought the same thing because, like, like, the fact that we're noticing that now. You know, we used to notice the bat flip back not that long ago. Now we're noticing the guy that does nothing. I almost feel like, boy, hopefully players are looking at that and saying, this is one of the best players in the game, almost going to win the MVP, and he's he's acting like he's been there before. You know what? Um back to Jose for a minute. He did that once. This is about eight years ago. And I thought he really kind of showed up the other team. And I grabbed him after the game. And he looked at me and he said, never again. And you know what? Wow. Never again. And so, wow. you know, what? Okay, but I, and I, again, and I don't, you don't want to take away guys having fun and enjoying, but I think there's a right way to enjoy the game. And it's playing with respect and, and again, I don't want to be the old guy that's always like, hey, man, this isn't how we did it. But I do think there's a way to play the game and a way to respect the game and the team you're playing. I totally agree. I, 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 I'm big on that, too. Hey, there's a big documentary coming out October 23rd. I believe it's on Netflix, and it's about the 04 Red Sox. And obviously, I think if you go back into baseball lore over the last 150-plus years, we will look back at that team and go, that was one of a kind. That was a one of a kind run. And I, I'm watching these documentary things. And I'm seeing Millar all over it and Poppy and all these guys. And Tito, can you just take us back a little bit to that team with this documentary coming out? Like, what memories do you have 20 years later of how awesome that run was? Case, 
it was the four best baseball days of my life. And you know what? Wow. And, and you, you, you've been around me. I know, I know I'm not the smartest guy in the room. Believe me, I know that. <laughs> but I was smart enough to enjoy, like, I, I didn't wait till it was over and be like, oh, man, that was really cool. I can remember being in the tunnel talking to Millar and Billy Miller and Dave Roberts, and I just thought we were going to win. We, you know, I, I, I pro- probably good thing I wasn't in Vegas and, you know, cause I mean, I just, like, I just felt like we were going to win and, and right. Like I just, that group, like Johnny Damon, like I saw how he would get so beat up and he would post every day. And, you know, David Ortiz, not only hitting the way he had, but keeping an eye on Manny and keep and Millar who, you know, people that ask me all the time, is it real? Yes, it's real. Like, like yeah. some guys you see and you're like, eh, that's him, man. He says things that would probably get him arrested outside the clubhouse. <laughs> but in the clubhouse, it's family. And, and I mean, like, there were days he'd say stuff, and I'd laugh, and I didn't want to laugh, but I couldn't help it. <laughs> that's so great. What about Manny? I think Manny's kind of – gone off you know he's still i think he's still playing somewhere i think there's a league man he's still playing it so i don't know if it's in india or somewhere i think man he's still playing somewhere what was it like you know with, with, uh, coach and manny ramirez so, you're probably gonna take me a little second to answer this he's one of the best hitters i've ever seen and he was an intelligent hitter i don't know if people realize how intelligent he was in the batter's box and I, and I think for the most part, his teammates, you know, he was quirky, but I think they thought he was funny and they certainly liked his bat in the lineup. When you're in charge of a team, though, and, and you, there's, there's a part of him that was difficult, as, as you know. And, you know, you're, and, yes. and in Boston, nothing is small. Every single little brush fire turns into, you know. <laughs> and so there were times with Manny that, I probably lost some sleep, but I'll tell you what, yeah. when he's in the batter's box, you had a pretty good feeling. Oh, and could he go oh. to right center better than any, any right-handed I've you know, ever seen? He, the, you know, he let, I, I love the, when they talk the term, let the ball get deep. When I let it get deep, yes. it would hit my knuckles. <laughs> but he could let that ball travel and he would rifle at the right center and be like, are you kidding me? It was unbelievable. Yeah. It was well, unbelievable. Sean Casey could do that, and he told me once that he had no job at all, and he called the guy and was like, hey, can I come play baseball for you? Is that a true story? Can you explain the Sean Casey so Red Sox I got to be careful. Some of the stories I probably can't say, but <laughs> but Kay, I, don't, let, hey, don't let Case fool you. He could hit, and he could hit like you're supposed to. He could hit the ball to left field. Like in, in today's game, I'd love to take some of Case's videos and show some of the younger guys. Like now, he wasn't blessed with the greatest speed in the world. Um, he, uh, I'm trying to think how to say that politely. No, you can say it just but, like that. But I'll tell you what. I mean, and I saw Case, you know, in Detroit and Cincinnati when he was rolling. And when there was a runner on second, you didn't want him in the batter's box because you knew he was going to put the ball in play and he was probably going to hit, you know, if you hung it, he's going to pull it, but he could hit the ball the other way. And he was a really good hitter. And I, that kills me to say that. God, I hate saying that. <laughs> you're the, Tito, you're the best. How much do I owe you, Tito? How much do I owe you? <laughs> Dude, I remember speaking of speed. I have to bring the story up because you said that. And this is one of the moments I'm like, I love this guy. I hit a one day we're, we're playing the Orioles, and you're going to remember this story. I hit a ball off the monster. You know, you hit it off the monster. Sometimes you're like, do I have two? Do I not have two? And obviously, with my speed, I'm like, probably should have stayed at, at first no matter what. But I was like, I got two. I got two. So I'm rounding first. Oh, boom, comes up. I'm throwing up at like 15 feet. I'm like, ah, come back. The, the Red Sox fans are like, you're slow. You're slow. So the next day, I know you remember, I hit a bullet in the gap. Hits the top of the fence. I'm rounded first and a little bit of a pimp because I'm like, I got that one. So I'm rounded first. Just came back from the hip flexor, so I'm slow. I got a hip flexor pull, and I shouldn't be running to second. Ball hits off the top of the monster. I'm like, I'm, I'm already made it, committed to go to second. Marcakis, Nick Marcakis grabs it off the top of the fence, throws me out by like five feet, chance out. 
fans are going nuts. I'm I'm a little upset at myself too. Like, dude, just stay at first. Like, it <laughs> this doesn't work out good. So I go over, change. I go over. I'm sitting in the dugout. I'm I'm a little pissed off. Sitting next to Paul Lassard, and you know, I'm just I'm maybe a couple of choice swear words about myself. And uh, Tito's over there. He's got you know he's got his big jaw, and he's over on the top step. He's like, hey, Case. Hey, can I talk to you real quick? I'm like, what's this you thought I was gonna scream about? at what you? Are you kidding me? <laughs> Yeah, I thought he was going to yell at me. I'm like, oh, man, this guy's this guy, this guy's seen enough, too. Everyone has seen enough. So I go over, and Tito's like, hey, man. He's like, listen, I, he's, I don't know. He's like, have you seen a doctor recently? I'm like, ah, not recently. He's like, well, you know what? You should probably see one because is there any chance that you might have polio? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I case I hope we haven't offended anybody today because, but, but you know what? I've told that story to more people, even at banquets. I've told that story, and people fall out of their chair, and I think they think that that I'm embellishing, and I'm like, no, 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 that's word for word. Like it, it, it was still, oh my god, but. You know what, Case? I know I know we show up every day and we're dying to win every day, but this is the stuff that 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 I love about our game. Like like, you know, as hard as you're trying to win, man, it's like the guys, you know, it's like you're human and shit happens and it's just going through it with guys that you care about. I I love that. Oh, dude, it was the great. That's when I was like, I love this guy. Like, I went back. I, I could do nothing but laugh. I told Paul Asar, it's like, Tito just asked me about polio. It's like, ah! He started dying laughing. It was so funny. Tito, I'd be crazy to ask you before, we, before you left. I just have to ask you, man. I don't know if people know this, but when Michael Jordan came back and p- decided to play baseball for one year, it just happens. Terry Francona has had the most blessed life of any human being in the world. He was... Michael Jordan's manager in double A when he was with the White Sox. Tell us a good Michael Jordan story that you were like, wow, that is, this is pretty cool managing well, him. In case I could go on and on because, and I've talked to you about this before. I had so much respect for him. And, and one of the things I told him early on was Michael, you know, you're, you're whatever, 30 years old, what is my age at the time. And, and I said, you know, you've made this money. I said, the guys in double A, here's what they make a month. So, and, and they've probably played three or four years already to get here. So I said, I, what I was trying to get across is you got to respect what we're doing here for this to work. And I'm going to tell you something. And it shouldn't be surprising when you think of a guy that's that good you you got to have those qualities that I'm like he was coachable he was smart he he loved he couldn't get enough baseball he wanted to know the lingo he was like a a, a gym rat and it was funny because he 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 uh he was polite but he didn't say thanks all the time but he was polite but when he went back to basketball he was on his way to a game. I think it was uh, it was a Sunday. And it was either Mother's Day or Father's Day, and he called the ballpark in Birmingham. You know, this is before cell phones, and and he goes, Tito. He goes, just uh, wanted to let you know that I actually enjoy basketball more now because I saw how you guys, how much you love your game. And he goes, I and and he when he told me, I was like, man. That made the whole thing worth it, but I, I, I would be hard pressed to be critical of him because of the way he treated myself, the coaches, his teammates, and and I mean he made it easy to be patient because you had to be patient with him in baseball because he hadn't done it, but it, it right. wasn't hard to be patient because of the way he acted, the way he treated people. How was he as a player as far as, like, how could he field you know, as a hitter? He, so he had a sore arm the entire year. And you would know this case. In the minor leagues, you used to you know, always take infield every day. You know, you had to. So his arm was dragging the whole year. I saw him in the fall league start to make adjustments. And he stole 30 bases, you know, which is not easy to do. And I also found out, sometimes the hard way, if you told him no, he will figure out a way to make the answer be yes. So I would never bet against him. I mean, you know, he's six foot six and he had some long arms. So there were some issues trying to sometimes to catch up with some stuff. 
but he he the stories you heard about him competing they're true yep wow wow well dude we would never get it bet against you, man. I am so excited to see you in a Cincinnati Reds uniform in 2025, as is the fan base for the Reds and every guy that's ever played for you. And uh, it's just the game with Terry Francona in it is so much better. I'm so excited, brother, for you and the Reds and, and your family. And I can't wait to see you. And thank you for your time, dude. I know you're, I know you're all over the place right now. You're trying to get a coaching staff. You're, you're doing this podcast and talking to these guys. So appreciate you took some time for me and me and Rich, man. We really, really do. And I love you. Case, I'll tell tons, you what. Man. Next time I'm in, in the area, we'll celebrate it with two chili dogs. Who am I kidding? Who am I kidding? Six chili dogs. <laughs> <laughs> at the bright new Brighton hot dog shop you and me will be saddled up on the bar with as many Case, hot dogs i gotta as tell possible. you before we go i know you're probably like get rid of this guy when 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 my dad passed away <laughs> we were at the funeral and when we left the funeral my three daughters looked at me and said dad hot dog shop <laughs> like it's like it's like no it's way. so good that you you gotta do it <laughs> So good. Well, dude, whenever I would go, Rich, I, I would go to the Brighton. And I always, I, I had to text Tito. I'd text him a picture of my hot dog and me smiling like, got a hot dog, bro. It's Brighton Case, hot dog shop. We were Let's in uh, Pittsburgh a couple years ago at Father's Day. And a couple of my daughters yeah. arranged for somebody. I don't know how they did it, but they brought up 100 hot dogs. And, and we bust back to <laughs> Cleveland. And that was a bad bus ride, Case. <laughs> that was two hours Case, of gas and it wasn't those guys it wasn't were from the not bus. happy i think that may have been the first day that chris thought about letting me go <laughs> oh, that's the best man that's the best tito man i love oh, you brother Case, we'll talk to you right, soon man god dang it man it's so nice to see you rich good luck to you man you must be a saint Ha, 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 